Right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Mike Colling, and it's my job this morning to welcome you all to this month's edition in our, our regular monthly seminars here at, at the IPA. Why this morning's seminar, and, and why MCNC bringing it to you? Well, this morning is, is, is all about how data and content drive customers from their first interaction with you to truly becoming a loyal, profitable customer. And I guess the data bit makes sense because data has always been at the heart of our offering. Um, we use data strategy and media to drive profitable, sustainable growth for many of you here in this room. But, but content, isn't that what creative agencies do? Only joking. Um, what really focused on today's topic uh, was a conversation that Ian, Matt and I had back in November of last year. And it was one of those sort of you know, two bottles of red wine conversations, which is, what's, what's a customer? And what really, really is a customer? Because back in the day, agencies like ours used to think, hey, place ad, generate response. Somebody gives client money. Hey, presto, customer, job done. Hand over person who gave money to client. But actually, that's not true. Because if you take one of our travel clients, we can, we do generate tens of thousands of new guests for them each year. But actually, 75% of the guests who come for the first time never come back. But if we can get a guest to come a second time, on average, they'll come another four times. Now that's a customer. And for one of our charity clients, last year we generated more than half a million, in fact, nearly 600,000 um, new single cash gifts. Now, are, are they donors, or are the 10% who then go on to give a regular gift the true donors? Um, and for one of our media owner clients, yeah, we recruit again about half a million new subscribers a year, but by the end of the year, about half of those new subscribers have lapsed. So I could go on, but it, it's clear to us in 2014 that as a media agency, we can't just say you're a customer because you've given us money. So we asked, what actually makes a customer? What differentiates between somebody who gives you money and then goes away and someone who keeps giving you money month after month, year after year? So we looked at the data. We're quite good at that. And we came to two conclusions. And the first is that becoming a customer isn't about creating a single event. It's about creating a journey that your customers are gonna go on with you. And then secondly, it's about telling a story. It's about creating content that unfolds as that customer goes along that journey with you. And it's about creating content that's relevant to that customer at each stage of their discovery journey. So it's not just about understanding what content customers need at each stage, but it's also understanding about whose voice is most powerful at each stage. Is it yours or is it their peer group? And it's about help, helping them to find the content they need at each stage. And sometimes that's about facilitating a process of discovery rather than just ramming it down their throats. So for our charity, it's explaining that a three pound gift can buy a blanket to keep a child warm, but 10 pounds a month is needed to pay for the teachers who need to be there in the camps because they've left their schools behind. For the travel company, it's about reminding the guests of the great experience they had on that first trip and then selling them a, sec a second trip in that context. And for our subscribers, it's about helping them discover the content that they will value so that then they value the subscription they're paying on a monthly basis. So for each client, it's different. And actually, for each segment, for each client, it's different. It's a different journey and different content required at different points. But the universal truth is this. If you can understand the journey the customers are on, then you can help them reach the destination that they will think is valuable and valuable enough to carry on giving you money month after month after month. And mapping that journey starts with the data. So, so that's why we're all here this morning. Um, and the guide for our journey this morning is a man called Matt Eccles. Now, I've known Matt for about 20 odd years and worked with him for, for many of them. Uh, our paths first crossed at um, WAV, is now RAP, uh, back in the 90s. Uh, Matt was a young Turk in Bristol. 
came to us and said, I'm going to set up a, an agency down here and I want to call it WAV. We went, well, that sounds nice then. Uh, and he created a very successful agency. Financial services, mail order, charities, um, travel, you know, a, a gamut of clients. He then very quickly came to London, joined the group board. First of all, as our group commercial director. He then ran the media division. He then ran Zalpha, the data consultancy group. And then he rounded out his time um, by uh, helping set up a, a direct marketing network across Europe. He spent the last eight years uh, running his own CRM consultancy, uh, helping clients like Samsung, the Wine Society, Camelot, Credit Expert, build their business. Uh, and for the last six months, he's been working with us, helping us deliver our promises to Royal Mail. Um, he's a man who's traveled a lot of these, the road on these journeys so far, uh, and from whom we've learned an awful lot. So ladies and gentlemen, Matt Eccles. Thanks, Mike. Mike is a lot older than me, by the way. Um, not really. Um, OK, so um, yeah, this journey. So uh, I, as Mike said, I've been 20 odd years in uh, direct marketing, CRM, customer marketing, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and the great thing is that it stays interesting because stuff keeps changing. And you know, we, we find new ways of trying to engage with customers, new ways of talking to them. There's new media channels. And there's a few things that have been going on over the last few years that have sort of really made me scratch my head a bit and think about life a bit more. Uh, the first is this big data thing. Um, and there are people in this room who will sort of roll their eyes at the idea of big data. And I sort of roll at least one of my eyes when I, when I think about that as well, because it can get a bit, a bit so watty and a bit overwhelming. And what do we mean by big data and all that sort of stuff? But nonetheless, the world is sitting up and talking about big, big data and trying to get their heads around what, what that means. And I spend a bit of time thinking about that stuff too. The other thing that strikes me a lot is that I get emails from lots of organizations who start talking to me about things that I'm not quite sure why they're talking to me about them. So this is a good example from uh, confused.com. You should sign up to the confused.com program if you want to be inundated with weird content. Uh, this one says, are you, uh, are you cutting back on booze for dry January? Said, I have no idea why confused.com want to talk to me about that or what, why, why that's of interest to them. Um, and that gets me thinking as well. You, you, know, you see a lot of that stuff now, people sort of trying to engage with you. Eventually, of course, I did work out when I looked at it long enough that they were trying to link into a life uh, insurance product, but that was you know, a bit of a stretch for me. Uh, and, and the third thing is that um, I, I, I ride my bike a lot whenever I can, um, is that I've bought bike stuff since Christmas from seven different places. Now, um, so on the face of it, I'm not very loyal to any of those, uh, any of those uh, organizations. It's all about the deal and you know, who, who am I going to look around and try and get, in, try and get some, uh, some, good, some bug, good bargains for this week. Um, and it made me think that you know, it, it's not, uh, I am, a, I am as, as I described in the headline, a, a flighty customer, a consumer. I will go and uh, get a deal wherever I can see it. So those things are all playing around in my head. And I sort of start trying to pull them together and say, so what is the data that we can really cost efficiently bring to bear to make our customer marketing more effective? What, what's, the, what's the sort of data side of getting that stuff all together? And then you look at the non-transactional content side of things. What's the sort of content that's going to add value to my marketing, uh, to my customers and add, va add value in that space? And then how do those two things come together in order to make our uh, relationship um, so strong that people choose us as opposed to choosing competitors. So I've got this content thing going on, as Mike described, and I've got this data thing going on, and I'm trying to make decisions about where I should focus my effort. Um, so what I'm going to do uh, 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 with Munal, who I'll introduce shortly, uh, is just share some historic work uh, that I've done in that area, look about a methodology that we're working on for building up a real evidence base on this, share some findings from some analytics uh, that we've recently done, and then I'm going to, obviously in good direct marketing style, I'm going to make you an offer um, that you can't refuse uh, at the end of the presentation. So uh, just to be clear, back to this big data thing, what it is, I'm into marketing. So I'm into, I'm into data and what it can do to help marketing. So 
Whereas you'll see a lot of examples where people talk about value from big data, data talking about operational efficiency, or they're talking about supply chain management and those sort of things. That's not the world I live in. But what I do live in is a world where there are lots of different data, data sets, and we'll talk about those in a moment, that do come to bear and make my marketing more effective potentially. Uh, the, the second thing, just so we're all on the same page, is to talk about what do we mean by content marketing. Um, and if you go back in time, then a lot of that would have been about PR, in seeding content, a lot of it would have been about um, uh, uh, magazines and, uh, and uh, brand publications. Now, of course, it embraces a whole load of things around social media uh, and other areas. But I do want to read this out. It's a, it's a definition that is, is, is helpful to my presentation, so I've used it, obviously. Uh, content marketing is a marketing technique uh, of creating and distributing relevant and valuable content to attract, acquire, and engage a clearly defined and understood target audience with the objective of driving profitable customer action. So that's the objective of content marketing. We're trying to drive profitable customer action. All good. And for me, that has three dimensions. We're trying to grow sales, we're trying to grow advocacy, and we're trying to grow brand equity. And the brand equity and the advocacy thing do, of course, translate into sales down the track, but they are worthwhile pursuits in their own right because of that. So I've got three dimensions going on to customer value. And then I play that back to myself and I say, well, if that's the case, what is the value of this sort of slightly abstract content that I start seeing brand owners talking to me about, especially when I actually click through that link. Um, sorry, and this is the link that says, share your view, uh, so share your new year budgeting tips. Um, so I, uh, I click on that and I see that a few weeks later, 45 people have engaged with that bit of content. And I'm doing some very rough fag packet maths in my head saying, well, Confused.com must have a lot of customers and a big, big prospect base, let's say the whole country. Is that 45 good? Is that a good use of my time trying to uh, talk to those people? Um, so I did a quick bit of analysis on all the email links on this non-transactional content that I'd had from Confused.com uh, over the period. And I see that, broadly speaking, of their 1 million plus customer base and their, let's say, every household in the UK prospect base, there's not a deep and meaningful conversation going on here. And then I take a note at the last thing and say, but lots of people want to look at their new ad for some reason. I don't know if you've all seen the Brian uh, campaign that's going on. Um, but I take note of that because that's suddenly interesting. I mean, that's in a world of its own if you look at those numbers there in terms of people's uh, engagement with it. Um, but then I said, well, let's try and just do a bit more mechanics on this. Let's look at Facebook as the big gorilla in the room when it comes to social media and say, how is engagement working for a brand like that? So I took three different sectors. I took the insurance sector. These, these numbers are deliberately as they are. You'll see in a minute why that's so. But at the end of the day, point, if I take confused again, 0.03% uh, of their customers as a, as, a, as a mathematical relationship have liked their page. And on average, only two people engage with any comment that they post on Facebook. So I can do some forms of that. And I look at that sector and I say, there's not a lot of engagement going on there with the content that they're driving and creating. I'm not making a judgment about it. I'm just saying it as a matter of fact, OK? Then if I look at the, another sector, which is food retail, I see another set of numbers. But broadly speaking, this multiplies by a factor of 10. Okay, so there's 10 times as much engagement going on, even if it's still very low numbers. And intuitively, that sort of makes sense. I can see that I'd have more to engage with around food retailing than I would around insurance. And then I take uh, the charity sector, and I see, again, this sort of multiple of 10 thing going on. And again, intuitively makes sense. You'd expect that a charity would have a lot more to say to customers, potential customers, than an, an insurance company might. Um, and actually, in some of these relationships, although I think you know, they may look small on paper, I think they start to get interesting um, when you look at um, you know, a, a, a one in a thousand uh, people liking a, liking a, a page. Um, you know, th uh, the 33,000 um, people like the Salvation Army page, and there are 350,000 regular givers. So I think that sort of starts to become interesting to me. Um, and as I say, you get that multiple thing going on that intuitively has a, a logical progression to it. So, so hold that thought. 
Uh, and I say hold that thought because then I thought, well, surely somebody must have worked all this stuff out because, you know, because people work stuff out. Uh, and as ever, I'm disappointed by how much people have worked out. So this is a study from uh, Columbia Business School that I think is really interesting. So 57% of uh, marketers not basing their decision, their budgeting decisions on any ROI analysis. 37% of respondents not including any mention of financial outcomes when, when asked to define ROI. Um, excuse me. 91% um, of senior corporate marketers believing that successful brands use customer data. Fantastic. 39% of them saying their own uh, customer data, uh, company's data is collected too infrequently or not real time. Uh, and, and then going on, this is, this is the one that sort of really is the, the, the big deal for us as we think about unlocking data. 51% say the lack of sharing customer data in their own organization is a barrier. Okay, I mean, that, that is the world I live in. I don't know how, about everyone else in the room, but you know, getting at the customer data, getting at any of the corporate data can be a bit of a problem. Um, so um, that's all interesting. So a framework that says measuring stuff isn't uh, at the heart of the marketing experience. And yet, you know, if you go and, go and search on Google, everyone's saying big data is a game changer, it's all happening. Um, that's great as an ethereal thought, but I can't find the stuff that says, how do you find the valuable data in the big data? It's just the idea becomes overwhelming. There's just loads of data, good luck. You know, that sort of tends to be uh, the feeling you get. So really what we have to do is extract what matters uh, from that. And if I start thinking about content, um, the, the, the value of specific strands of content is even less well reported. There's very little uh, empirical data out there about what content works. Um, so I went off to the uh, Content Marketing Association and I looked at um, uh, all their case study bank. Uh, and it, I was reminded of the world of PR several years ago when um, you'd, uh, you, you'd go to award ceremonies and PR agencies were winning super awards for the number of column inches that their particular uh, article had, uh, had managed to uh, achieve. And you get the sort of flavor of that in here. There's uh, uh, average sessions clocking in at over seven minutes. Fantastic. Um, significant step in altering the company's perception in the eyes of the motor trade. Amazing stuff. But I can't really see what the value is in terms of translating that uh, into customers. Um, and then I went to one of the big... Uh, with the uh, uh, um, uh, apologies to IDEO for picking on them, but I went to one of the big suppliers in the content marketing uh, technology space and said, send me your best case study. So they sent me a case study from e-consultancy, and I thought, great, there are numbers here, 414%, 251%, seven times, 1.5 times, that's exactly what I need. And then I read the case, and actually it's a case about segmentation and being relevant in marketing. It's not a case about the content did this. It's a case about we tailored what we said to people, okay? which is fantastic stuff, but it's not answering uh, my question. Luckily, Mike sort of helped uh, get me a little back on track with uh, an example from uh, an MCNC client. So this is a, a piece of seeded content that MCNC used as part of the customer acquisition strategy. Um, it's, 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 it feels and is an a, a, a feature um, it's written like a piece of editorial. Uh, and this is credited with being a top 10 lead generator of all the marketing activity that happened in 2012 for a 13 for APOS therapy. Um, and, it's, and it's a piece of content. It's a very specific piece of content. Great, I can put some value on it. And that's where I'm trying to get to. So I'm not trying to question whether content marketing is a good idea. I actually have no doubt it's a good idea. I'm trying to get at what bit of it is a good idea and where does the specific value come from. And similarly with data. Data good, but what data really good? These are the questions that we're trying to unlock in here and trying to get to the bottom of because they're the things that you action in, in real life. Um, so, am I the only one? We did a survey uh, beforehand. Thank you for those people who completed it. Fundamentally, this slide says, People recognize that data and content have a significant role to play in their organizations and only score themselves as doing okay in terms of unlocking that stuff. So there's a gap between how important people feel it is and how well it's being unlocked. And the two barriers are the obvious barriers, they're the ones you'd expect. Proven uh, contribution hasn't been established yet, why would I? Um, and no development budgets, which, to be honest, maps into the same thought, right? You get the development budgets if you can prove it's going to work. 
So the, the sort of prove it works is what's stopping people really getting under the skin of this stuff. And that's what we're, uh, we're in the process of trying to do. So there are three different challenges. Deciding which content's powerful, deciding which data is powerful, and getting at the data, which I'll come to uh, in a while. So I want a rigorous approach to building out the evidence base. How do we prove what content works, what data is important? So this is a process that we've mapped out for the content side, and you repeat the same process pretty much for the data side as well. Identifying every non-transactional content engagement with a customer ID attached. So where can we understand the relationship between an individual and a piece of content? Grouping that uh, engagement by type. So what type of uh, engagement asset is that? What type of content is that? Is it video? Is it a webinar? Is it uh, a fact sheet? What, what is it? Uh, correlate that uh, content uh, with transactional value, brand affinity and uh, advocacy, as I've discussed. Um, and then measure relative change over time. This is important because we have to look at those periods pre that content being available and post that content being available and changes in customer value in those two time periods. Because what you have to be careful about doing is what, what I've seen in some studies is looking at, and then we introduce the content and guess what, everyone loves us. Well, it doesn't tell me what the relationship was like before you introduced the content, so it doesn't help me much. So we have to be rigorous about that. We have to standardize for other factors. We have to standardize around customer value and customer types uh, and those sort of things. And then where we're trying to get to with this is a sort of ROI coefficient. We're trying to get to the ability to say to clients, in your sector, this sort of content tends to add a lot of value. And in your sector, this sort of content doesn't. Now, if we can take that, play that forward, and as I say, we're definitely on that road, that's going to be particularly exciting. Uh, of course, we need to recalibrate over time. So there is a clear process that we're building out for building that evidence base. Um, and then, of course, we need clients. Uh, we need permission to use the data that we already have, and we also need additional data because we're living in a world where a lot of marketers aren't able or, d or don't naturally have access to some of the data that can be important. And I'll come on to describe a bit about later, but um, in one area I've looked at, customer service data has ended up being critically important to ability to add value to customer relationships, and the marketing team have had to go and get that because they weren't getting access to it previously. Um, okay, so we've got a process and we've got some clients uh, coming along. Um, and that's when um, I thought, ooh, this could get a bit complicated. And people I was talking to, including clients, were saying, ooh, that's really exciting, but that could get complicated. And suddenly that whole world of the data's a problem and how do we get at the data becomes an issue. And you know, how, do we, how do we do stuff so that we can evidence value quickly to get the organization excited? So uh, I uh, rang my friends at Tableau, who I know well, and said, do you want to play ball with this project because I think there could be some stuff here but I'll need some dedicated resource to making some stuff happen and luckily they've said yes so um, Rinal who uh, is going to come up and show you some stuff in a moment uh, has been helping me with some data uh, uh, over the uh, over the last couple of weeks so what is that so here we have I've got two or three things coming up everything is anonymized because that's the way I get the clients to let me talk about stuff but here we have a retail client, trade supplies area. It's a pretty simple data set, actually. It's not as comprehensive as some of the other things I'll show you uh, momentarily, but uh, customer ID level stuff, transactional data, all the, a lot of engagement data, web, web, the web data, email data, social data, and we've got media source uh, in there as well. So um, my brief to Rinal was, um, here's the data, have fun. So he's now going to show you some of the stuff that he did with that. What can we do with data, right? So as uh, Matt mentioned, right, um, we had different customer IDs and uh, a whole bunch of measures associated with those customer IDs. So as you can see over here, I have uh, purchases. So on the top, what I'm showing is for different types of purchase categories, what's my average revenue? Then what's the revenue I'm generating? So it looks like search is where I make the most amount of revenue, followed by event, phone, referral, and mail. If I now look at non-interactions, I created a simple histogram out of it, and it actually looks like the color on here is revenue. So it actually looks like this is a perfect normal curve, and it's very interesting because what it tells us is 
more interaction does not mean more money. Then a simple bar chart, which gives us all the non-transactional interactions, just sorted it descending by revenue, and right away I can see that, okay, I should, I should invest more uh, on the videos. And here's a little uh, scatter plot around uh, revenue and uh, page views, along with uh, revenue and email clicks. There is a diminishing factor here with the uh, page views and the revenue that it generates. So more page views beyond a certain point does not necessarily translate into uh, more revenue. So um, there are two things I really want you to take out of that uh, session, uh, that, um, which, uh, which, which is not necessarily by Tableau. Um, they are um, that in there, in, lost in there uh, at the front end was actually two insights that came out of that data. The first was this idea of diminishing returns on the, uh, of the interactions. I, I, I hope you all picked up on that. So there is some clear evidence in that bit of sample data that actually you can engage people with content, but only to a degree does it make a difference to their value to you. And we saw that in two different trends uh, in there. The second was, uh, and, and you'll see this as we go on, the importance of video. It just turns out that video correlates very well with increasing value from customers in that example. Um, and those are two important things uh, in terms of the analysis that we're doing about the value of content and the data that matters. Th the second piece I want you to take out is that, and this is important actually, is that ev everything that Rinald was talking about in terms of that difficulty at getting at data is a reality. And anything that content, uh, sorry, technologies like this can do to help users get at, cont uh, get at data so that they can analyze it quickly and easily will make a big difference to the effectiveness of your marketing. It's as simple as that. So I'd encourage anyone in here who struggles with those issues on a day-to-day -day basis to think about how you can get things like this to help you understand that, that, that uh, data and understand that content because it will make a difference to performance. Um, right, the next piece of data that we have to work on, and I don't have the results of this yet, but it is much more interesting and much more complex, and I just want to share with you why that is. So uh, Samsung's an organization I've done a lot of work with um, over the last two years, and in fact, about 18 months ago, embarked on developing a CRM platform in order to begin the uh, empowering really the whole context of uh, direct communications. So if you think about FMCG, durables brands, traditionally they sell through retailers, customers nothing to do with us, retailer gets on with it. Now the world's changing and because um, direct communication is now so much more affordable uh, and, uh, and easy to make happen, brands like that want to get into talking to their customers. As soon as they want to get into that, they need CRM platforms, they need campaign management tools, they need all that sort of stuff, uh, and, and they need data. It turns out they have absolutely piles of data. They've got customer service data, they've got people contacting them about um, their products and things going wrong and what do I do about it and all that sort of stuff. They've got product registration, so um, any of us who are of an age will remember the days when we all uh, had to fill in product registration forms so that uh, organizations could take that data and sell it back to us. Um, so they have a lot of product registration going on. They have a bunch of digital assets. They have something called My Samsung, which is a, 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 a personalized engagement tool for customers where you, you log in, you register, and uh, My Samsung uh, is your little Samsung world. They've got the website, samsung.com. They've got social media assets all over the place. They've got blog forums, Samsung Village. Now, interestingly, we also have their brand tracker data. So one of the things we've been able to do is map their brand tracker surveys onto the uh, database. That means that we can look at people's affinity to the brand on the database in comparison with the consumer universe. And that's really important to them in justifying why on earth they would have a database and consumers. So if you think about most um, FMCG brands, things that matter to them are around brand affinity, which preferred products they buy, all that sort of stuff. And we can now put that uh, onto the database. Um, more web assets. They've now got their own retail uh, network being built out. You may have seen that, that they're looking now to compete directly with Apple in terms of retail presence. Um, they've got a super app, which is something that sits on a lot of their mobile uh, phones that allows you to access a load of, uh, a load of uh, data and technology services underneath there. 
T smart, anyone bought a Samsung TV in the last couple of years probably has a smart TV version. You're wired into the internet through that. Um, there's a load of third, third, third party data, of course, that we can bring to bear on this. And then there's the engagement stuff. So I've got that uh, in, in twice. But there's the, the email engagement, which is basically the comms program is driven through email. We've got all the engagement data. There is data coming out of our ears that we now have um, Samsung working with us on getting into a state for us to do this analysis uh, for them, which is really exciting because there's going to be lots of flavor and depth in there. Um, and then I was thinking about uh, other examples I could bring to bear. And um, I spoke to other clients about where they were with this, and I was sort of hitting a bit of a, 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 a brick wall in terms of this is really interesting, we need to get into this, but we're not there yet. Um, and so I looked back in time, uh, and I suddenly remembered that I'd spent a lot of time working with B2B organizations, um, professional services companies, marketing technology companies, all sorts of people. And I, I just I'd totally forgotten how it's central content marketing and data are to their marketing models. So what, what this schematic basically shows you is that the way that these guys see the world is we have people out there who are not yet ready to buy, and we have people out there who are ready to buy, and if they're not ready to buy, we're going to keep talking to them so they remember us and they keep coming back to us, and then when they are ready to buy, we'll have that conversation. So they have a whole engagement strategy. Now, that engagement strategy is driven by content. It's driven by giving people information and stuff that they will find interesting. And I would say, in some consumer markets, and I was thinking about fundraising applications, if you think about Big Gift or if you think about a legacy, you've got a similar thing going on. There's a bunch of people who may not be ready to commit right now, but you need to keep engaging with them so they are. Same with durables. You know, I only buy a fridge every five years. How do I make sure you think about my fridge when it, when it comes to that time? So uh, there's, there's this content-driven approach to prospect and customer management. This is interesting. Here's an example of an organization I worked with a while. This is uh, SDL, uh, formerly Alterian. The reason I'm just showing you this slide is that uh, I checked uh, uh, two days ago. There are now 150 different content assets on the SDL website that you can use to get information about their, uh, their product services, engage with them. And they range from podcasts, video, white papers, webinars, how-to guides. It is all over the place. There is tons and tons of it, which is great. And, and, and as I said, it, the marketing program drives engagement with that content. Why don't you download our new guide? Why don't you watch our latest webinar? Why don't you watch this video? It's all about engaging the audience. Now, if I take some data from a different client, because I don't want to associate these two things, and show you how that plays out, it becomes really interesting because I have actually done this work with three different business-to-business uh, -business providers uh, over the last three years. And what you can see very clearly is a relationship between different types of content and ROI. So if you think about this, this model where we're trying to engage people, we have all this different stuff, we have our white papers, we have our podcasts, we have our webinars, and then we understand how that converts over time because sitting behind this is a CRM system that allows us to understand who's engaged with what. We can then correlate that with future sales and value. And what that helps start thinking about is where should those relationships be? And in this example here, uh, as I say from a, a business services provider, it's the how-to guides that stand head and shoulders above everything else in actually translating into value. And actually, I, I, I'm, you know, obviously, those confidential things, I can't tell you who that client is. But what I can say is this. If you're operating in a space where your proposition is around how you add value in terms of supporting a customer through a decision-making process, the fact that you've got how-to guys out there sort of makes sense. It makes sense that that would be the content that correlates well with conversion to sale. Um, I'd also highlight again that video plays out well um, in this example. So there is a clear relationship between uh, that content and, uh, uh, and, and uh, customer value. And it's also true that you can see differences in, in the data that's being fed into those, those models. So, and again, it probably intuitively makes sense, but in this example here, all that sort of hard, almost traditional, if you like, CRM and direct uh, marketing data 
is the stuff that plays well to sales conversion. So what's coming out of the CRM system, uh, what's happening at the telesales operation, those are the things that in those interactions are the ones that translate best to, um, to, to value. But there is some interesting stuff happening around some of that social media stuff and around some of the, the, the uh, web uh, engagement areas. Where is not proving good for this client as an investment in time and energy are Facebook and uh, another social platform that businesses tend to use a lot, which is SlideShare. So immediately we can start helping this client make some decisions around where they should be investing their content and data efforts um, and, and using that to, to optimize ROI and their business performance. Now, going back to the point I made earlier from the uh, Columbia Business School data and actually a point that uh, Renel uh, uh, told us about, this idea of sharing customer data is a big barrier. It is a huge problem and technologies can help with that, um, there's no question, because they can help you realize what data, the value from what data you have pretty quickly. But I would also just say a lot of that, it, I've, I've got a bunch of experience in this area and I could, I could uh, share wine with lots of people talking about it. I think it comes down to a lot of soft issues in the organization in terms of trying to get this data out and trying to get value from it. So one thing is in trying not to overwhelm the organization with requests for data. And, and uh, you know, Mirnal sort of spoke to that as well. He said, what happens is because you get frustrated with your ability to get the BI team or the IT team to give you data, you sort of say, give me everything. And as soon as you say, give me everything, it just becomes too hard and too difficult. So one of the tactics that I've found that works a lot is trying to get a feeling for what data I think could add value for me and just asking for that one piece. Just getting one step at a time, making something happen. The second piece is getting sample data. Not worrying too much about getting all the data, but getting enough to prove a point. Um, and that's often a, 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 an issue with uh, social data where actually, uh, and, and there's a whole different conversation we can have about the death of the single customer view in the short term while people work out how to connect social data with say, uh, databases, but putting that to one side, you can actually find enough examples of creating the connection, the ID connection between social media and a CRM database in order to do some correlations. You can find enough in relationships. So getting sample data is good. Low hanging fruit, you know, where, what is it easy to get hold of? Where, again, I got a good example from a client from last year where getting the hold of the web data was going to be quite important to understanding some value out of some programs we were running. The good news was that the web data was hosted at a third party organization, not hosted by their IT team. That was relatively easy to get hold of because there wasn't the department that likes to say no, saying no. We were able to get it from a third party and, and do a workaround on, on that low hanging fruit. And the final thing is getting senior manager support for this sort of activity. And that's about generally making a business case. Now, often when you're trying to look at new stuff and you're trying to say, I think there is a lot of value for this organization in terms of working out where we should invest in our content strategy or our data connectivity strategy. I don't think you can come up with a business case that's cast iron, but what you can do is show people the sort of impact that can be made. People just need to see, get a flavor of what the difference could be to understand whether it's worthwhile. And I'll tell you something uh, important about that. It only struck me this morning, actually, as I was uh, um, having a cup of tea, is that, um, we, we, if you think about it tactically in terms of the campaigns that we run, it's true of, of, of a media agency or a direct marketing agency, we spend a lot of time sweating about the difference we can make through changing a subject line or changing a media placement or, you know, in the old world of 25 fours versus 20 doubles and all that sort of stuff. And those are really important things that we have no problems at all evidencing to the client make a big difference in terms of ROI and revenue. And yet, if you think about it in the context of something like this, and if I just stick with the content point for a moment, the idea that different strands of content can have a difference in terms of your business performance, it, it intuitively makes sense, and we should be putting as much energy into that. In fact, you know, I, I think we should be putting more energy into that than we should be into some very granular and tactical things. This is, this is about what should our content strategy be for engaging our audience, and as I say, we've got some beginnings of some evidence to say we can work that out and we can get to some, uh, some truths that are going to help people. Now, so why is that all relevant to 
different people maybe in this room, and I picked on just a couple of things. Um, I think for charities, there's two interesting things in here. So, Institute of Fundraising study last year, only 30% of uh, fundraising uh, managers said, my, agreed with the statement that my organization has a clear, tangible case for support. Now, if you haven't got a clear, tangible case for support that you can articulate to an audience, the fact is you ain't going to be raising as much money or generating as much support as you can. Content has to be at the heart of how you create that case for support. You have to find the ways to get those points over. You have to find the ways to connect with people who are going to then move from, you know, maybe making that first donation, as Mike said earlier, to actually staying with you and understanding where that value and where that relationship sits over time. Um, and, and as I say, content and data are absolutely at the heart of understanding that and deciding where to make those investments. And in, in, interestingly, I think it's even more true in a world where we now have fundraising operating in lots of different spaces, events being a good example. So somebody who has chosen to um, uh, run for uh, Race for Life, how does, what is the content journey and the data journey that best best makes that turns them into a more valuable supporter of your organization. It's about, you know, understanding what the triggers are along that path and what the right decisions are to be made. And I think there's a similar dynamic going on with holiday companies where right now, in fact, if you go to, go to any awards dinner, anything to do with marketing, it's holiday uh, and travel that is dominating the smart use of data type stuff. There's a hell of a lot of that going on. And uh, in the last two years, it's been... Uh, uh, the Grand Prix winner at, at the DMA has been, you know, best, uh, best use of data has been related to travel. And in this example here, this is from 2012, this is the best customer journey campaign, which is for uh, Thomson Cruises. And the reason why I want to raise this, uh, this is another sector, is that if you think about it, the whole, of, the whole, idea, whole idea of holidays and um, travel is rich in potential content opportunities. You can talk to people about absolutely anything to do with where they're going, what the weather's going to be like, things to do, where to go for dinner, what else we can sell you for the hotel, you know, all sorts of stuff. You know, you could write a list as long as you're armed. The challenge that gives you is what is the right content to talk to them about? What is the content that's going to make a difference in driving value and driving relationships? Brand equity, transactional value, advocacy out of that customer base. The, the, the challenge, I think, for holiday companies is going to be that plethora of opportunity around content and, and data as we go forward. Because as everyone rushes into the uh, use of data, it'll be how you differentiate within that that makes a big difference. Um, and here's a thought just to that uh, point. This is something I did with an FMCG client uh, about uh, two years ago now. So I was engaged by them to uh, give them their first interactive customer relationship marketing program which basically meant, um, as, as an FMCG brand would, and, and quite rightly is, you know, we need some sort of interactive digital presence that will allow consumers to engage with the brand online, get some value, da -da 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 -da. And uh, the great thing was, when I uh, looked at, so, and we had, sorry, we had four bands of customers based on their uh, brand uh, preference scores. So again, back to the world, FM, the way FMCG thinks about consumers, it's about relative brand preference, because if they have high brand preference, they'll buy more of my stuff, uh, and vice versa. So we have four bands here. Now, what this chart sort of very um, simply shows is that when we introduced the new interactive uh, strategy for engagement, we saw a, an increase, significant increase in brand preference for two of those groups. It's actually the two of the mid-level groups. For the, uh, the high-level group, made not very much difference. I was about to use the colloquial then, but it's, uh, it made uh, very little difference. And then intuitively, again, when we think about high-value customers, then if they're buying all of our products all the time, there's very little we can do to get them to buy more of it. Um, and the low-value group, it had uh, no difference at all. The important point here is, and I, and I say this as a, as a, as a lesson in, uh, in lo longevity, is but as soon as that freshness and that excitement around the content had worn away, we, end up, we ended up back at square one. So this is a story about how we can, we can get those flighty customers to be less flighty. We can certainly make those uh, tactical uh, engagements work, but we have to think about the long term in terms of how we keep them there. And that's about a content strategy rather than a campaign. That's, that's the difference between a programmatic approach and doing campaigns. So clear evidence that, you know, that we can make a difference in that, that flightiness of customers. 
So I'd summarize our findings uh, to date in this area um, in this way. Which data is most powerful? From the data we have looked at so far, it, you, know, you will not get away from the fact that transactional data, what are people doing, is the big, coral, you know, the thing that correlates best with value, uh, almost you know, self-evidently. But interaction data, getting people to engage with stuff, definitely seems to have value to a point. And as you saw from uh, Munal's slide, you know, it is to a point. At some point, you get diminishing return. Um, and a third powerful piece is, is that response data. It's how do people en engage specifically with your uh, marketing communications, your transactional marketing communications. Getting at the data, as I said uh, a minute ago, I just think a lot of that is quite soft, but getting some corporate sponsorship, one step at a time, not trying to ask for the world, uh, evidencing value to stakeholders, and then trying to do things reciprocal. Uh, I remember... Um, helping an IT department get some breakthroughs on some uh, engagement issues they were having uh, back into the marketing department. And that was very helpful to me in getting some data out of that IT department um, about three months later. So, you know, that sort of stuff helps as well. Um, and which content tends to be powerful? Well, I, I've described it here as anchored in the brand promise, but I think there is something about making sure that you have a clear permission to talk to people about what it is you're talking to them about because of, what, because of your reputation and what your brand stands for. And I, I just take you back to that confused example right from the beginning. I still scratch my head wondering why Confused.com want to talk to me about whether I'm giving up booze for the new year and how they see that translating into some sort of engagement that, that in turn translates into value. I'm, you know, I don't have the data. It may be fantastically successful. The 25 people, or whatever it was, that engaged with that program may have all bought all their insurance from Confused.com for the next 12 months, for all I know. But I'm struggling with that. I think you have to be wedded in. This, we've got you know, some evidence there, and it goes back to that B2B stuff about how-to guides and that sort of thing, that you have to be about what, um, what your brand is about. And similarly, being, uh, addressing uh, a, a need in your content seems to be helpful so far. So again, back to that video. A lot of you know, video guides, a lot of explanation, a lot of helping you understand what it is uh, that you're, you have questions over. Uh, and as I say, the uh, uh, video is, as, as the last point that does seem to be correct. Now, I have seen some studies in the past that say video is incredibly powerful in terms of engagement. So that's a tick in the box. What I think we're beginning to do here is take it beyond engagement, yeah, okay, people watch videos, got that, to, and it translates into value. And that's the piece that's the different piece uh, in here. So those are, those are some uh, takeout thoughts for you where we are so far. I do have, um, oh, no silver bullets, sorry, yet. Yeah. So will all this work for you specifically? Should you go away and start looking at videos? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying you should go and look at how videos work for you. Um, Next steps for us, uh, build out more analysis. So we've got Samsung data being analyzed, uh, hopefully over the next couple of weeks. We've got two other clients lined up uh, with data as well. Trying to build out the financial brand and advocacy dimensions, because for me, they're all uh, important, and we have methodologies lined up for doing that. Validating and adopting as, as we go along, producing these coefficients, uh, and then starting to share these findings with, uh, with this audience and, and other people as well, so we can help you inform your thinking about data and about content. Um, we have an offer for you. If you want to be in this project and you think you have the sort of data around content uh, that will be interesting, then we can put you into this project. So if you have a chat with me uh, after we've finished and you think you know, there's something interesting in there, obviously, I say obviously, we will make sure everything is anonymized, uh, as most people would want, but we will want the right to share the anonymized outcomes with, uh, with, with other people. Um, and i just leave you with one thought, just going back to, um, I, I have to work around to cycling somehow, just getting back to uh, riding my bike and, uh, and my promiscu uh, promiscuity as a, uh, uh, as a purchaser of bike-related kit. Um, when I actually thought about that a bit deeper and I went back and I just looked at uh, how much, my wife's not in the room, is she? How much money I had spent uh, on bike stuff since Christmas. Um, it does turn out that most of my bike spending is with one brand, as, as it turns out. But it is because of content, and it is because of the brand that they evidence through that content. So it's a, it's a small uh, uh, mail order place called Planet X, and there are two things that uh, strike me as uh, examples. They make me smile, so you know, I buy from them. 
One is, um, I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, you probably can't see it. The subject line on this email on the left is um, pedigree lurchers for sale. And I can only, th the only reason they could have called a particular bike a lurcher is so they could run that subject line. I can't, why else would you call it a lurcher? Um, which, I know you love that. And then the other thing, which is, uh, you know, for older people in the room, uh, they do this thing called Reader's Wide Rides, um, which is, uh, <laughs> and, and my bike is in there somewhere. Um, okay, so that's where we are. Thank you very much.